Episode 11. Valentine's? Is that some sort of date? There is, Pierre would have to admit, one great advantage to your only magical power being the ability to detect changes in the atmosphere. Useless on the battlefield, most of the time, sure, but for planning a date? For knowing exactly when to make a quick stop at a cafe just before a passing shower drenches everyone else on the street? Now that, he could admit, was useful. February 14th, two long weeks since Mocker's arrival, Valentine's Day at last, and Pierre had plans, quite a lot of plans in fact. In some ways, planning what to do on a date with Mocker had not been that difficult. He simply picked out all the activities he had avoided doing these last few weeks. And so it was that they set out to see everything that great old city of London had to offer. They strolled across Tower Bridge, that most expansive crossing of the mighty River Thames, that pushed and rushed and gushed beneath, bridged to the either side with massive pillar-like towers. They stood in front of the House of Commons, Big Ben, the Tower of London, and of course Mocker found a great appreciation for the Queen's Guard, who stood in their bright red uniforms and tall black chimney hats in front of Buckingham Palace. And they took pictures with everything, Mocker insisted on doing so. The old Polaroid camera taken from Pierre's storeroom had never seen so much action in its life. They dressed well, Pierre in his finest coat and boots, Mocha in her braised flock and a dainty skirt, beneath that with a slightly out of season wide brimmed sun hat atop her flowing white hair. And they travelled though they travelled, in every form of transport they could find, in classic London black cabs straight off the television, to the underground tube lines and even the public Boris bikes famous in the city. Marka's face was alight with delight at each new method. She had watched cars and trains these last two weeks, but to actually ride on them was an experience in and of itself for the girl out of a medieval setting. They stopped at cafes and stalls for tea and cakes, lots of cakes in fact, as Marka insisted on eating a lot of chocolate, something about honouring the traditions of St. Valentine. And then they finally arrived at the one place they had both known they would have inevitably arrive. It's even better up close! Told you it wouldn't roll away, Pierre laughed. Marka attempted to pout, but struggled to hide her raw excitement. Jokes like that make you sound very old, you know, she teased before turning her attentions back to it. The London Eye, a massive white ferris wheel that dominated much of the skyline of the city, all on the banks of the river and from atop overlooking the sprawling landscape beneath it. Were tickets hard to come by? Marka asked. Hmm, ah, well, I suppose so. Usually you have to book months or even years in advance, especially on Valentine's Day. But that, what's the point in being a celebrity if you don't pull the odd strings, eh? People were falling over themselves to give me seats, thank you very much. Pierre boasted proudly. Marcus smiled. Then my thanks is even greater. I hope it wasn't too much trouble. Pierre blushed at her earnest gaze staring up at him through her chestnut brown eyes. <laughs> no, no, no. No trouble at all, really. <laughs> Maka just smiled in response to his embarrassment, and before long they were at the t front of the queue and taking their seats aboard one of the oval-shaped carriages of the ferris wheel, a carriage all to themselves, of course. What a perfect view it turned out to be. The clouds had all but cleared to give way to an afternoon sunshine. The sky almost glowed its serene shy and sad. There it was, the thing Pierre had secretly hoped to see most of all, her smile. Not that it took much to cause Maka to grin kindly, but this was ever so slightly different. This was a look of utter, pure joy, a toothy grin and bright-eyed expression of true happiness, curiosity and wonderment. Of course she had been up high before, he'd been with her then, or at least with the Arctic, that is, when they had scaled mountains to slay dragons, and then there were all the tall castles and palaces she had lived in. But this was truly something special, a unique feeling us humans only ever gain from the exhilarating moment of being moved through the sky, whether by aircraft or like they did now, to watch the world slowly grow smaller beneath you, to look out with more perspective on everything you never realised, just how much you know and love. And to Pierre, that was the most sobering part of it all, a part of what made him feel so very enthralled by Mocker's every action. We often miss the beauty around us, not just in majestic cities or beautiful rural villages, but in all places. Even the most run-down or decrepit of settlements will have some small corner of beauty hidden beneath. Wherever there is life, no matter how small, there is some wonder to behold. He knew it to be true now, for Mocker had shown it to him, that he had spent thirty years ignoring the beauty of Earth. All those places he had seen and things he'd done had all just been an effort to return home to Balia, to the beauty he had lost so long ago. But Mocker was different. She took everything in, all of it. She asked questions, poked, prodded, laughed, 
and tenaciously learned. She picked up on everything and appreciated the beauty of it all, which in turn made her the most magnificent centre of everything. Do you think we can see our house from up here, Pierre? I hadn't thought of that. I, I suppose it might be possible. He laughed back in response. She could fly in that blue sky that surrounds us now and those feathers of beautiful red and white and how beautiful she would look doing so. As they finally disembarked the machine and began to walk again through the city streets to Pierre's next mystery location, Marco reached out to grab for his hand. This time he did not dodge, though he did blush, as they walked hand in hand down the pathway. That man is a crook, I tell you, a crook! Three hundred pound for the two of us? Three hundred? Pierre exclaimed. There, there, my good man, you didn't have to order quite so extravagantly, Marcus said, patting Pierre on the shoulder soothingly. They walked now down a narrow enough alleyway, having had their evening meal at London's most flamboyant, and apparently most expensive, restaurant. The city was now lit by the last dregs of dusklight. It might be February, but the sun still set before seven at that time of year, and now the warm glow of the street lights began to spring to life. Leaf mocker, who in their right mind puts bloody gold on a stake? And what's with that thing he was doing with his hand? What sort of way is that to spread salt for all that's holy? Pierre, your heritage is showing, mocker jeered coyly. My what? Your short hands and deep pockets, man. Your economic attitude towards spending. She winked, grinning wolfishly at the further blush that's brought to Pierre's cheeks. Oh, well, yes, I, I suppose it is a special occasion and all that. Still, gold leaf on perfectly good steak, Marker. The two laughed about the exuberant price of things in the city, all as they rounded a familiar corner and found themselves in none other than that place. Marker giggled, a giggle that no longer weirded Pierre out, but instead seemed perfectly natural now. It would appear, old friend, that we have wandered back to our favourite spot by complete accident. <laughs> we are like homing pigeons, no? Pierre concealed the knowing grin. <laughs> Indeed. Whatever are the chances? Well, as we are here, we might as well seat for a moment, shall we? They had made their way across to the two park benches, the ones with the black and grey chip van between them. The same old public park, just a short distance from home. Well, except for one large discrepancy. It would seem even the proprietor of this shop is not around. I have never seen this place so quiet. Mock amused, reading a piece of paper duct taped onto the front of the food van's closed down shutters. Ed, out looking for love, all hints on its whereabouts are welcome. Ha! You can't still be hungry, girl. What? No, 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 of course not, Mocka reddened. It's just that it's, it's too quiet here, that's all. Almost like we have the entire park to ourselves. Hey, this isn't your doing, is it? Some elaborate ruse to, to snog me under the old beech tree? Pierre appeared to choke on his own spit. <laughs> snog? What sort of word is that to use in the company of a man? Mocka giggled again, and even Pierre couldn't help suppress a fit of laughter. They walked over to their usual bench, the one not under the old beech tree, thank you very much, still hand in hand as they sat down. A rest after the full tour of the city and all the food they had had was most welcome indeed. I must admit, Pierre, you're not half bad at showing a lady a good time, Marcus smiled. Really? And this is only the tip of the iceberg. Wait till you get to see the lights at Christmas. The whole town lit up like the feast days back home. Oh, and there's Halloween. You can walk around in your whole night's regalia and no one will bat an eyelid. All Hallow's Eve, they call it. And then there's Easter. Now that one really is for kids, but I'm sure you'll find the Easter egg hunt they host in this very park to be a most heartwarming sight, you know. They hunt for eggs. Uh, well, chocolate eggs rather than actual eggs. Chocolate eggs? Now surely you must jest. Ha! I most certainly do not. Oh, and St. Patrick's Day is pretty soon, too. We could get a ferry across to Dublin. You'd love the ferry, I'm sure of it. And Dublin on St. Patrick's Day? Well, the streets are full of these massive parades with huge carnival-style floats. And everyone dresses in bits of green while drinking absolutely too much. To be honest, Valentine's is probably the least interesting holiday of the year. You've seen nothing yet. Marcus squeezed Pierre's hand a little tighter and leaned in her head against his arm. Perhaps... But I think Valentine's will always be my favourite. Why is that? He replied while flushing bright red at her closeness to him. She's so very warm. Because, silly, it's the event I got to spend with you. Dee, don't you mean the fur? Pierre's words were cut off 
as a whining sound cut through the sky. Soon following it came the thunder's boom of a red sparkling light up above. Maka's eyes glimmered once more in pleased surprise. Next followed a green rocket that made a diamond pattern, then another in a blue triangle, a third in yellow circles, then five all at once forming together to make a massive, multicoloured star in the sky above the rooftops. Yeah, look! Aren't they beautiful? So many and so close! It must be fate that we were passing as this happened. Pierre averted his eyes a little, fully aware that it was far, far from their fate. Another barrage going up in a staggered line one after another, like someone running their hand along a keyboard. Crimson, gold, emerald, azure, magenta, one after another, dazzling shapes and intricate formations, enough to make even the illuminators of ancient China envious. What's the point in having a three-story house in the middle of London, if not to use it as a firework display platform, eh? <laughs> I bet the police will be heading to my front door even as we sit here now, Pierre thought to himself. Pierre? came the soft voice beside him, barely audible over the continued whine of more fireworks above, though they must surely be nearing their end. Mm. One hand still clasped to Pierre's, the other lay gently on his knee. Maka pivoted up and kissed Pierre in earnest. Not a snog or a peck. No, a simple kiss of the utmost honest kind. The warm locking of lips together, the physical transmission of feelings held most dear. The numbing effect as though the flashes of light and bursts of sound all around them had faded away. A momentary union of complete isolation. Just the two of them in the world for a short fleeting moment. United. Just a simple kiss? Maka moved back when it was done. Staring up into Pierre's shocked, wordless and most of all kind eyes. She leaned in again, this time up to his ear, as the last firework made its lonely path through the sky and erupted in a shower of red and white diamonds. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you so very much.